That's great. And uh, we'll, we've allowed you to share your slides, Dr. Kwan, if you um, okay. would. Uh, we'll all stop sharing and allow you to take over with your slides. Okay. Um, let's see. Present. I mean, meanwhile, that you, you get the slides, I want to share with people that. Um, and you saw that in some of our reports of RNO, uh, the partnerships that we had forged with people that we didn't know before, uh, like Dr. Kwan and others, uh, has been fantastic, has been in, in my view at least, and I think my colleague will attest to that, um, a bit of the silver lining on COVID-19. Uh, tremendous partnerships, tremendous desire to collaborate, to share, to uh, just um, pursue good public health policy together. So wanted to say that. Yes, all yours. Okay, sounds good. Um, can you hear me clearly? Excellent. Okay, um, so thanks everyone for uh, joining us this evening. Um, today I wanted to have a discussion on the situation of COVID-19 in Ontario, uh, look at some data um, issues with uh, data, what we don't know, um, and we can have a discussion on masks for Canada. Uh, thank you to Doris uh, for having me on and thanks for your relentless advocacy and thanks for Arnell for the support. Um, so, here we are today. Um, so disclosure, uh, I have no financial um, conflicts of interest. I'm not selling anything. I don't receive any funding. I don't get funded by Bill Gates or Big Mask or all these things that people say. Um, all I've made is $21 from Medium for my mask article and that buys me uh, four coffees and maybe half a box of masks from my clinic. Um, so today, this is our agenda. Uh, so first I'll go over the situation in Ontario um, today, uh, as of June 29th. Uh, then I will talk about masks for Canada and what our group is, our goals, and um, what we are uh, promoting. It is not a uh, mandatory universal masking. It is uh, masking in high risk uh, situations with appropriate exceptions. Um, then we will talk about um, getting back to normal and then there will be some time for uh, questions and comments. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so this um, these are some graphs I've been posting on Twitter every day. Uh, so looking here is just the uh, cumulative uh, cases in Ontario um, today. So if everyone remembers back in March, uh, the world suddenly changed. Um, there was a lot of fear and anxiety and a lot of uh, changing situation. It was declared a pandemic and schools closed. So there was a lot of um, anxiety around that time. Um, every day there seemed to be a record high number of cases, a record low number of cases. So I wanted to understand for myself, what is the situation? Like, is it actually going up? How does it compare to uh, previous days? So I started making graphs and um, to post on Twitter to share it with other people um, and to translate it to something that was understandable for the general public. Um, people deserve to have facts and data because it helps us have a sense of control over the situation and it helps um, justify all the sacrifices we're making, whether it's for the lockdown or for you know temporary closure of businesses. Um, people deserve to understand. So um, the curve at the early on, it was an exponential uh, growth curve. So now now it has started to uh, flatten in terms of both cases and deaths. Um, this is the um, graph for the um, daily cases and daily deaths and the daily uh, resolve. So uh, cases is the red line, deaths is the blue line, and resolved is the green line. Um, as you can see, we peaked in cases um, around the end of April, um, and then there was a delay in the peak of deaths, which was around uh, early 
May. It has uh, since uh, come down slowly, um, which is good. That means that everyone's efforts are playing a part in uh, contributing to controlling uh, the virus. Um, what we don't know is regarding the cases. Um, are these asymptomatic cases? Are these um, mild? You know, are they um, even if they're not in the hospital? Are they on oxygen? Are they having? Um, is it runny nose or diarrhea or shortness of breath? Uh, there's no uh, breakdown of the symptoms yet, uh, and we don't really know too much about the comorbidities involved um, in the patients. So in the federal summaries, there has been breakdowns for a few conditions like diabetes and heart disease, but not really a very clear breakdown of different comorbidities. So hopefully that's something we will find out in the future. Um, for this graph, we are looking to compare um, the new daily cases and the new resolved cases. So the more resolved cases, if that's more than the daily uh, new cases, that means the total number of active cases is coming down, which is what we want. So it's been kind of a dance. Some days it's still higher, some days it's um, the resolve, some days it's uh, new cases. So hopefully the resolve continues to go up. Um, today was not great for numbers, but uh, there was 257 new cases and 89 new resolved. However, I really encourage people to look at the seven day trends, um, not get too excited over the ups and downs of one day of the week. Oh, the other thing is for resolved cases, we don't know if these are truly resolved cases. Are they having any long-term health effects, um, lung damage, other neurological symptoms, fatigue? We don't really know too much yet. And I think that's really important because that can also cause a long-term burden on the healthcare system and for patients. So this slide is from the um, Ontario um, page that updates daily. Um, so as you can see, there are uh, some numbers on long-term care residents, which has been you know, a major tragedy for Ontario. Um, we don't know a lot of things still about long-term care. Um, and also there's other settings that we don't have breakdown for cases. So uh, retirement homes, uh, group homes, uh, homeless shelters, correctional facilities, um, what about home care or indigenous populations? Um, like what percentage of the total cases are these contributing to? And now there's also the uh, farm workers that are uh, being affected. So it would be helpful if this uh, was also um, information that was updated daily for everybody. Um, there's also health workers associated with long-term care, but what about health workers in hospitals, uh, in all these other settings we've mentioned, and are these healthcare workers nurses, are they doctors, PSWs, um, other uh, health professionals? So the breakdown would also um, help us understand, and uh, especially for healthcare uh, providers, I'm sure everyone's most concerned about that. So how did they get um, infected? Was it because there wasn't enough PPE? Uh, were they not provided with PPE or was it incorrect usage or was it um, because of uh, infection from a patient or from a coworker? Um, and was it routine patient care or were they doing aerosolizing uh, procedures like intubation? So when we know more details, it'll also help um, advise on infectious uh, control protocol. So this is the daily cases versus the daily tests. So a lot of people you know, say, uh, the more you test, the more cases you find. It can be true. Um, it cannot be true. Um, what we've seen actually in Ontario is that the number of cases uh, tests per day has gone up. So you can see the red line going up, which is really great because the more we test, the more we understand the situation, the more we can catch any chains of transmission. So as the testing is going up the red line, the cases is actually decreasing, which is really, really good. Um, the next slide, I'll show you the percent positive, which is another um, important marker to watch too. Um, what we don't know about tests is we don't know um, how many people are being tested. So these are the daily tests, uh, but that's the number of tests. So some people are tested more than once. Uh, some people may have a positive test and a negative test and vice versa. So it would be really helpful to know. The province used to report the number of people tested, but I think now it's just the daily cases. So I think the numbers are there somewhere. So it'd be helpful if that was um, 
published as well. Um, we also don't know what is the test turnaround time that's in uh, differs across regions. Um, you know, it used to be maybe two weeks, some places less than a day. It, it really depends. Um, and the backlog can also um, be very different in different areas. Um, the other thing we don't know about is um, we don't have serology testing available in uh, Ontario or Canada yet, except for in research settings. So serology, um, which means we're looking for antibodies to COVID-19, that can help determine, you know, how many cases we are missing if they do random uh, population uh, sampling. So this is another um, graph looking at tests in Ontario. So the orange line here um, is showing how the percent positive is decreasing. Um, and the green line is the pending. So usually the pending is slightly under the um, test per day, which is okay too, because it takes time for uh, cases to be processed. This is a slide on the uh, hospitalizations in ICU. Um, I think this would be one of my favorite graphs because that really shows all the hard work that everyone in the hospital has uh, put into caring for COVID-19 patients. And these are our frontline workers. So anyone who's watching who's a you know, frontline working with COVID positive patients, you know, really appreciate all the work that you do. And this is really good to see how the hospitalizations did peak around mid-May and that has slowly declined. And also the ICU, um, you know, peaked actually around early April and then it has slowly declined. So that really indicates that um, uh, the cases are, you know, getting better. And hospitalization uh, numbers are not as susceptible to um, bias in terms of, you know, testing or cases and things like that because it's a more easily measurable marker. So this is a good sign. Uh, today it did tick up a little bit again for hospitalization, but again, I would like to watch the trend for a few days before uh, getting too concerned. Oh, one other thing for this um, is um, when the hospital or ICU numbers are changing, so is it because uh, someone has been extubated as successfully and they're going home, or is it because the patient has passed away? So we don't know what is, um, you know, the numbers in terms of survival rate for ICU or hospitalization. So that would be also helpful to get. Um, another thing is regarding long-term care patients. Are the long-term care patients um, being offered hospitalization or are they passing away in long-term care? Like, are they being offered? You know, some, some may not want to go to the hospital according to goals of care. Um, so we totally understand and respect that too. But the question is also, are they being offered a transfer or not? Okay, so this uh, graph is looking at active cases. So this is another great graph because it looks at how many um, known cases are in the community right now. So as you can see, it peaked around the end of April. And there was kind of a second bump um, around late May and early June, and it has gradually come down, which is also quite reassuring. Okay, this is another cumulative graph. Um, so this includes the resolved uh, cases in Ontario. So there's over 30,000 resolved cases, uh, which is really great. Unfortunately, there's still about 2,600 people who have passed away uh, from COVID-19. This is a graph that shows the percentage of proportion of people in each category. So uh, resolved cases actually account for 86.5 percent. Um, the deceased uh, percentage is 7.6. So again, we don't know if um, if the resolved cases they're truly resolved or how long there will be a long-term health effects. By definition, um, resolved means they are 14 days past the episode date, um, and it's if they're not hospitalized. So it's possible they may be at home, but with uh, symptoms that need further management, um, such as like on oxygen, things like that. Okay, this slide um, shows the current active cases and a proportion of, um, I guess, based on severity. So uh, some people are saying that the cases now are less uh, severe. So looking at this graph, we can see whether that's true or not. Um, so most of the cases now, about 88.7% are at home. Um, and 
the bottom part here is showing the hospitalization or an ICU. So this could be because maybe uh, younger people are getting uh, infected or because they may be taking more risk in entering the community um, and our long-term care patients are finally becoming uh, more protected and also the uh, people who may be at uh, older or at risk may be self-isolating more carefully. So this is a great um, uh, graph um, or a number of graphs is uh, by Simon Colomb. Um, the link is there. So he also tracks the regional changes. So whenever we're looking at like the cases and deaths, this is really a regional disease. Uh, you know, we can't compare Toronto to a rural region. Um, so looking at this helps us understand where exactly are the cases and where there are more outbreaks. For example, on the bottom left, you can see that Kingston um, has gone up a little bit because of the uh, nail salon outbreak. Okay. So this is another website um, for anyone who's interested in data. Uh, HowsMyFlattening.ca is a great um, initiative started by Dr. Ben Fine um, and also uh, with over 200 collaborators. So there's a lot of information on there, including the RT, so the transmission um, value, mobility data reports, uh, regional analysis, also uh, long-term care staff infected. So there's a lot of information, uh, which is great if you're interested interested in data and understanding the situation. Uh, one of the other um, things I wanted to point out was uh, the socioeconomic analysis um, here for also on the How's My Flattening website. So um, COVID-19 cases and deaths are concentrated in areas of high material deprivation and in areas with high visible minority uh, concentration. So although um, COVID-19 can infect anyone, some groups have pre-existing barriers uh, that impact their access to health services, um, or they can face increased risk of infection and poor health outcomes. So um, we know that uh, some data is being gathered on these socioeconomic uh, determinants of health, but you know we would like to see more uh, published data and research uh, so that we can address the disparities, especially for uh, second waves. Um, and we need to understand, is it because they're unable to self-isolate? Is it because of the nature of their work? Or is it because they are using uh, public transportation more? Or is there like cultural differences in terms of mask use or access? So all-cause mortality is something that's really important to understand because it helps us see the uh, true toll of COVID-19 um, on society. So not just confirmed COVID-19 cases, but also potential deaths because of delayed uh, surgeries, tests, uh, procedures, um, because of the shutdown. So this is really important because when we're only looking at COVID-19 deaths, we're not really understanding how um, other Canadians may be uh, impacted. So this is a chart showing how in different uh, countries there has been um, approximately a 60% higher death toll due to COVID-19. Um, the data for Canada was initially not available for at least one to two years. Some provinces have made this data available and are starting to publish it. Unfortunately, Ontario does not have this data yet. So you can see all, all many other provinces and territories, but Ontario, we do not know what is going on. Hopefully we will find out. Okay, so moving on to uh, the next section. So um, masks Jennifer, for Canada. Jennifer, yep. I wonder mm -hmm. if we can do first on data, if you give us like five, 10 minutes to answer questions on data. Okay, sure. Uh, that would be, I think, fantastic. I just want to add from an RNO perspective that uh, the websites that I so far put there are really important. Um, mm -hmm. And those have helped us hugely. And in fact, this is how we connected with Jennifer to push for policy agendas. Um, including the issue of social determinants of health that we have been pushing from the beginning. And first, some in public health said, well, well, or in politics, they said, well, but this will kind of, you know, discriminate against people, which will mark people, will, you know, all the usuals. And then 
the some of us saying no you cannot go blind if you want to help from a good public health perspective you actually need to understand and of course when that data was started to be released we started to understand but i think where jennifer is taking it a bit farther even that we need to understand so okay so low socioeconomic strata you have more uh, pronounced incidence of um, COVID-19, but what is it, right? Is it the living situation? Is it the traveling in, in public transportation? Is it, what is it? And, um, and I don't think we're even touching that piece at this point, uh, which will be really important to, to do um, both in, in wave one and as we move to wave two in the fall. Uh, so I think that's important. There were a couple of questions in the chat that I want to put to you. Um, first of all, let me go from the top to the bottom. Uh, if we will post the presentation, yes, we will post with your permission, of course. Uh, we always post the entire, um, the entire, uh, I lost my chat now. I don't know why. I lost my chat, Susan. Okay, Something. that's all right. I can, I can read the questions if you like. The questions and the comments, please. Yeah. From um, top to bottom, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so people are really grateful for um, this and information. And if you can your put your camera, Susan, if you can put your camera on, please. Thank you, yes. Um, so just wanted to thank you for the presentation so far, um, Jennifer. People are, uh, appreciate the transparency, transparency of the data and have been following you on Twitter. Um, and so just a question, one of the questions is, are you using the date of reporting or the date of symptom onsets in your graph? Uh, in my graphs, I'm using um, date of reporting uh, because I base it on the Ontario, um, like the daily published. On the Ontario website, so ontario.ca, and then you just click on coronavirus, um, they publish a daily epi epidemiological report, and that does have a graph based on um, date of acquisition of symptoms or something like that. So that one is also helpful. Um, I do publish that recently in like my thread of daily graphs, so it is um, very helpful too. Great, thank you. Um, Jennifer is uh, thanking you for all the great information. She says, my understanding of antibody testing is that it doesn't differentiate between SARS-CoV-2 uh, and previous coronavirus infections. Is that the case? Um, so there hasn't been a proper serology test. I think that's been approved for general widespread use in Canada, uh, probably because of concerns like that. If you're going to be um, promoting a serological test, it has to be sensitive and specific. You do not want any false positive or false negative um, in a significant amount, otherwise it will not be helpful. So if it does pick up other coronavirus infections, that's not really helpful because that will be a false positive. So hopefully they can can develop one. I know there's many different companies that's uh, creating one, so hopefully it'll be available soon. Okay, great. And I think you just answered Sharon's questions, really, why are we not doing serology yet and are other provinces doing serology? If yes, what are the results? So I think we've got, I think you've answered those. And, and then there's a question from Leanne. She says, in regards to testing, what evidence have you found for the efficacy of throat swabs as a test for COVID? I have been told that some testing centers are using throat swabs instead of the nasal swab for the general public. Oh, I just lost that. Let's see, where did that go? Um, that somehow disappeared. So as you find it, if you it's okay, got it here. It's, um, issue, you got it the there? Issue, sorry, yeah. if you can also address the issue that RNO has been pushing big time um, in the daily calls that are not daily anymore. The issue of um, less invasive testing for, for uh, residents in nursing homes, because so. Okay, Maybe just, that, was this, that was basically what this question was about. Um, oh, good. Utilizing throat swabs instead of nasal swabs for the general public. Um, and with those increased testing the province. So I don't work in a COVID assessment center, but I think from what I understand right now, the best test is still the nasal swab. Yeah. There was a recent study published this week that was comparing that swab to um, a saliva, like a spit test. I think the nasal swab was still better, but 
definitely if we can do a throat swab or a spit test or you know even a self swab something that's easy for people that will be a lot better for long-term care residents for children for people who may need repeated testing due to the nature of their work or exposure um, so right now i think it's still nasal swabs but hopefully those other modalities will be available Great, thank you so much. That is um, what we have as far as questions for now. So you could probably so go back to the next part. Mask for Canada, which by the way, I just want people to know that the RNA is part of it. And uh, the first time that I, I put it on the blog, I started to see lots of nurses saying RNA. So thank you for allowing us to participate uh, with your group on this. Yeah, thank you for the support and um, definitely I would like to tell everyone more about Mass for Canada and anyone who does support the message. We are still um, accepting more signatures. So let me figure out how to... And it is in the last blog for people that want to know on the one that I sent on Friday, I think. Yes, Friday. Now it's every Friday only. Okay. Since now. And on the question how we are going to prepare for LTC, I can comment after of what RNO has been doing, what I know from the province, and uh, what we are pushing for, and then Jennifer can add from her end. All yours, Mask for Canada. Okay, thank you. Um, so Masks for Canada. So our uh, group, essentially, it's a group of health professionals um, from across Canada. So different uh, physicians. Um, there's also, I think, some nurses, dental hygienists, um, even lawyers, um, just other concerned citizens. Because when we started, this is before Canada even recommended masks. At that time, they were still kind of on the fence about whether masks um, were recommended or not. So we were getting really concerned that it wasn't being used as one of the interventions uh, against COVID-19, in addition to hand washing and physical distancing, things like that. So it's an adjunct to and not a replacement for any of those other things. So our goal is that masks should be used um, in addition to other factors in order to restart the economy safely and uh, keep Ontarians healthy and uh, reduce all cause mortality. As you know, we do not want another lockdown, right? And um, restarting the economy is very important to reduce all those other um, unintended consequences of COVID-19. Um, so currently, uh, I'll show you some statistics about um, numbers of Canadian wearing masks, but we are actually quite low, um, actually much below the United States. Um, and uh, we want... Um, masks to be mandatory in high risk settings, um, which is defined by ACT, and I will show you um, what that means also. Uh, so far, we've had 1400 um, health and science professionals sign the letter, um, and many of which are nurses, so thank you very much. Um, and um, so, First, I would like to talk a little bit about evidence um, for the masks. So as health professionals, we know there's a lot of evidence for masks in the healthcare settings. Um, there's also differences in terms of like a medical mask and non-medical mask N95 and things like that. So for specifically COVID-19 evidence for masks, that's still an evolving uh, situation. Uh, generally, the consensus is that masks are helpful for source control. So catching the droplets around the wearer's mouth um, and reducing the risk of uh, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission, especially um, on a population level. Um, there was a recent study in June from The Lancet, which was commissioned by WHO. So that was a systematic review of 172 studies um, that demonstrated both benefit for medical and non-medical masks. Um, there's a lot of um, other different studies. There's been a study from Yale that showed that a cloth mask may be able to have a cost savings of $3,000 to $6,000 USD in terms of preventing infection and morbid morbidity and mortality. Um, 
what we are looking for for you know solid evidence we will not get right now so there's not going to be a systematic review of multiple rcts looking for non-medical masks for the public for covid19 in that specific situation i think eventually we will get there but we cannot wait until you know a few years down the road in order to act there was not an rct studying lockdowns there was not an rct studying hand washing or distancing but we recommended um, and mandated some of those things too so um, we must act on precautionary principle because as everything is reopening right now, time is of the essence and we have to protect the lives of uh, Canadians um, and including our healthcare workers too. We do not want to be facing additional outbreaks and uh, overwhelming hospitals at all. So, so far we've done great, but we want to keep up that momentum and prevent any recurrent outbreaks. Um, so the other thing is, um, the other thing is, so there has been some mixed messages um, and somebody wanted me to address this. So it is important to be open and transparent about what we know and what we don't know about masks. So one thing was initially, um, you know, the CDC and Dr. Fauci had advice against mask use, but Dr. Fauci did come out later saying that they recommended that because of PPE shortages. So I don't think that's, you know, like we have to be honest with people, masks do work, but they didn't recommend them because of shortages. So now that we understand that there's options for non-medical masks and things like that, we should encourage the public to be wearing them. And I also, if, if I may, I also want to intersect there um, that I tip my hat from all the public health people that I know, quite frankly, is Dr. Fauci. If he can withstand the pressure he is withstanding from his own president about everything that really should happen in public health and that um, he needs to stand up for, even next to the president, when the president says whatever barbarity, I really dip my hat. Um, it's really, for us as nurses, it's an example of a public health official that stands and speaks truth to power because uh, everybody knows, I hope, online uh, on, on this webinar, which now is 150 people, uh, that um, masks in the US, unfortunately, have become a, polit a political statement. You know, if you wear a mask, you are against Trump. If you don't wear a mask, you're supporting of Trump. Um, the reality is that the health of people, um, especially vulnerable people, but everybody in between, uh, should not become a political ping pong ball. And it's very, very sad to see that that has been the case. And um, I really tip my hat for that guy. I really do. I, every time I mean to come in front of the president of the US, you know, after he says a statement and then say, well, here is what you need to do. It's just a formidable example for the rest of the world especially as we have moved on and on and on, because at the beginning, I think was less, but he now has become, he obviously has made the decision, you know, if they want to get rid of me, get rid of me, but I'm going to do what's right for the public. Yeah, it's definitely difficult. And like now that he is promoting mask use and he's not given as much, you know, airtime to speak to people about it, I think that's difficult too. So it's, it's quite, um, you know, it's quite difficult that masks have become a political issue and really it should be a health issue. And it's, you know, for public health, it's not about who you vote for or anything like yeah. that. It's really just to protect one another. And the other thing, Jennifer, and I, I think you may be aware or not, but I tip my hat for Jeff Fowey at the, um, at the, at uh, Michael okay. Garron Hospital. Uh, that was one of the first, actually, to put in the website about the, the cloth mask with even, um, he's the director of infection control at the hospital with even uh, how to make them. And, no, uh, and of course, it's, he was trying to do this to care, especially for vulnerable populations and protect them. So not only for elderly people, etc. Um, and also he used that, or he inadvertently, what happened is that it became really a community building activity because people that were at home and that are, you know, they could rally around something that was positive to protect the community. And if you look, the community in East York is not a well-to-do community overall, 
in terms of socioeconomic status. And I think the data will start to show to show the performance is better, not only for the mass, but a whole variety of things of interventions with long-term care, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, kudos to him also, amongst many other people, and you, of course, included. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think uh, Michael Guerin Hospital had, it was a thousand masks challenge or something like that. So it, it was really, you know, one And of they the got that, a lot more yeah. than what they asked. Yeah, for sure. It, it really inspired me to, to look into the whole masking issue and hope that it would, you know, spread beyond just that hospital. Um, so this slide um, is the ACT. Uh, so that's uh, what we defined as high risk settings. Um, so obviously it still depends on areas of disease prevalence. If you have a community with zero cases for a long time with no case in there by, you know, that still might not apply. But generally ACT would be all indoor public spaces, um, crowds as in when you can't distance from others and uh, public transportation. So those are the three key areas to help people remember when they should um, consider wearing in masks. Um, if you cannot wear a mask for medical reasons and for young children, of course, you should not have to wear one and nobody should be forcing you to wear one if you cannot wear one. Um, we shouldn't be shaming people. So if people can not wear a mask, uh, we shouldn't make assumptions about why. Um, so that's really important for when stores do enact uh, policies uh, for mask wearing. So they have to accommodate with personal shoppers or curbside pickup or any other um, options uh, for these people. Um, for young children, so that really uh, depends also. So the cutoff age we've seen is different across different jurisdictions. Uh, some say age of two, some say age of five. So it really depends on the child. And, um, you know, we can teach kids to wear masks just like how we teach them to tie their shoelaces um, and we can teach them math. So I'm sure wearing a mask can be learned by a lot of kids. And also face shields is a great option. They come in very uh, fun designs for kids with like superheroes and things like that. Um, um, this is really important to consider when going back to school. Um, the sick kids released some recommendations, um, which is kind of the starting point or framework, but um, they didn't recommend any masks. And we were, um, you know, hoping they would uh, consider that for any future revisions because, um, you know, we deserve, or the children and educators uh, deserve every form of protection available. So I think there should be a focus on providing masks for um, children and teachers and educating on uh, proper usage. Doesn't mean they're gonna be wearing the mask the whole day or anything like that, but for high risk situations, especially older kids who can learn, it really should be something to consider. So, I mean, I don't know, my, my granddaughter is going to be three on Wednesday, and she will not even get passed through us without the mask, she alone. And I, I would say, come to whatever, not close. And she says, no, I need to wear the mask. And she, and you know, and very calmly and as a natural part of what she does. And when you look at the pictures, guys, of the flu, of the Spanish flu, which by the way, didn't start in Spain, I keep saying to people, started in the US. But in the Spanish flu, you see the entire families young, young kids with the mask. So I, I think we underestimate what kids will do to protect their grandparents, to protect other kids, etc. And it's a habit, right? And this is, this is not going away anytime soon. It's not going away anytime soon. So I think as nurses, we have a really an obligation to get behind the cause and, and serve as role models, right? Yeah, for sure. And like summer is great to start, you know, teaching kids to do it in case for uh, return to school in September. So, you know, most kids, most kids will not have severe symptoms, but there are rare cases of Kawasaki-like syndrome, which can be very uh, severe or even fatal. And it's not just the kids, it's also their educators. Educators are not young always. Um, they could have comorbidities and the children have families, educators have families. So we have to protect everybody involved in the school system. Um, so, oh, and the slogan at the bottom is one that um, someone from my group came up with. So my mask protects you, your mask protects me, together we protect society. So that really speaks to how it's everyone's effort together that we can work on this. 
Okay, so this is a, just a brief overview of the timeline of masks. So in March, you know, most people, um, they were told not to use masks and we didn't have to wear it if we were okay. And then that slowly changed. So um, maybe it's something you could consider. It's a sensible thing to do. Maybe it's reasonable um, in April. Um, and then in mid-April is when they mandated masks for air travel and for returning travelers um, for like the 14-day period. Um, and then only in May 20 was when masks were strongly recommended for the public. So it did take some time and I think this might account for why there is some hesitancy around wearing masks because there has been a confusing message, but we really have to take into consideration there has been like emerging evidence, you know, we're understanding more information about asymptomatic transmission. So um, now that the latest recommendations are that is strongly recommended, recommended, then we should be promoting and educating people about wearing masks. Um, so what have other countries done for masks? So many countries, um, over 110 countries, have some sort of mask requirement. Um, some countries that don't have a mask requirement um, have uh, already universal usage, especially in a lot of Asian countries, because that's just the cultural norm. If you are sick, then you will um, wear a mask uh, to be considerate. And now um, that there is a pandemic, then everybody generally just wears a mask when they're going out. So um, either through mandates or through culture, um, most countries have used um, public face masking for uh, helping to control COVID-19. So the U.S. So actually, the U.S. has also um, mandated masks in um, most of um, the states. Uh, some were implemented early, uh, and then some have been reactive in terms of um, increasing cases, uh, outbreaks, um, repeat exponential growth, as we've seen this week. So there has been more and more states that have mandated masks. So in terms of um, this poll, this is a ledger poll done on June 22nd. Um, so you can see that USA uh, actually has a higher proportion of people wearing masks compared to Canada. Um, even though, you know, on the news, we always hear about Americans talking about like their freedoms and things like that. Um, they're actually pretty good at wearing masks compared to Canadians. So um, grocery shopping, they're at 78%, whereas we're only at 55%. Um, going to work, they're at 36. We're only at 18. Uh, so those can be, you know, something to consider because some studies have shown that we need about 80% mask usage in order to have a significant impact on reducing uh, COVID-19 transmission. So how can we get to 80%? Because I looked at this poll, I think maybe two, three weeks ago, and it was 51% grocery shopping. So over the last few weeks, we have not really made any increases and we are reopening, you know, stores are opening, bars are opening, nail salons. So how can we increase the mask numbers in order to have a significant impact and prevent the uh, increase in transmission again? This, uh, this poll is looking at um, how public acceptance of uh, mandatory masking compares between Canada and the US. So both in Canada and the US, they actually um, generally rec uh, are uh, accepting of mandatory masking in high risk uh, public confined spaces. So like grocery stores, shopping malls or public transportation. So more than half of Canadians, about uh, two thirds of Americans. Um, so with any mask mandate, uh, we also need the government to be on board with um, support. So, for example, increasing PPE production, manufacturing, sourcing, distribution, um, especially for healthcare workers and then for the vulnerable high risk populations and then for everyone um, when there is adequate supply. Um, so when, you know, in an ideal world, when there's unlimited PPE supply, it would be helpful if there was uh, mask stations, you know, like how there's hand sanitizer stations, there will be mask stations, vending machines with masks, just more options available to improve uh, access. Um, some countries have distributed cloth masks for the public, um, and some countries have legislated measures to prevent hoarding or reselling or price gouging. Um, so if someone doesn't have a mask, we should 
shouldn't be fining them or um, pursuing any criminal penalties. We should be giving them a mask, um, helping them to understand why uh, we should wear a mask. Um, and the government should also consider public messaging campaigns to help people understand when to wear a mask, how to wear a mask, how to clean it, uh, things like that. Um, just to ensure that they are wearing it properly in order to be most effective. So this is a poll from the US. Um, so this shows that um, stores that implement masking policies, people are actually more likely to shop there. And that was across all political um, parties. Um, people were not going to avoid stores that implemented this policy as much. Generally, this is probably because um, people feel more safe shopping in a store with a mandated mask policy. So this is good for business, right? Um, you don't want any outbreaks in your business. You would have to close. You would lose staff. Uh, so mandating masks is also smart for a business perspective. So these are our open letters. Right now we have Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec. So we have over 1,400 across the country who have signed. Uh, we are looking into one for BC, but these were our most pressing areas with the most number of cases. Um, in Ontario, uh, Guelph, Windsor, Access, Windsor, Essex, and Kingston have mandated masks. There are a few regions looking into it, Waterloo, Markham, under consideration. A lot of transit systems have also mandated masks. Um, Longos is one that has mandated masks from the beginning. Um, Quebec today just announced mandatory masks for public transit. So that's really good. Um, we are hoping that the provincial leadership will um, take this into consideration so that if they can, um, you know, provide a set of parameters uh, for the individual public health units so that it allows for consistency across the board. So whether it's saying if there is you know, X number of cases in the community, um, then that should be mandatory. Just setting parameters now, um, not waiting for an outbreak where you're taking a reactive approach. Um, so if you do want to sign, you can go to maskforcanada.org and then you click open letter and just pick whichever letter, assuming Ontario for most people here. Um, and then you can add your signature if you want. Uh, so masks really are a layer of protection, both literally and figuratively. Um, and we are hoping that it will no longer become a symbol of sickness, but it's a symbol of health, respect, um, and it shows our collective efforts to help win the fight against COVID-19. Okay. Um, somebody had asked me on Twitter, um, they said, can you shed some light on how you can respond to people who say it's dangerous for healthy people to wear a mask and how to respond when they won't wear a mask since uh, the WHO first said it wouldn't work. So, I mean, as clinicians, generally we understand masks don't cause a lack of oxygen. Um, you know, surgeons operate with them. We wear them all the time in our clinics. So I think it's important to educate on, um, these misinformation and also to encourage people on how to wear a mask properly and cleaning to avoiding contamination. So that reduces the risk of masks um, having any sort of harm. Um, we have to help people understand it's an adjunct to other measures and it's not an excuse to um, ignore distancing rules because that's also another risk. Although studies have shown that people who wear masks are more cautious and tend to be um, more compliant with like hand washing and distancing. And to convince people, you know, it's hard to convince people, but you know, it's okay for people who don't wear masks to change their mind too. It's smart to change your mind as you are getting new information. Um, it's okay to change your mind and want to protect your health and protect other people's health. Um, and as um, doctors, nurses, clinicians, we should lead by example and wear masks in these high risk settings so that it becomes um, more normalized uh, in public. So, um, and as you know, the WHO has also changed their position. So um, looking at the most up-to-date information is very important too. Um, this is just a quick slide it's from information from New York Times and in the US. So for states where masks have been mandatory, there's actually a continued reduction in cases. Um, but as you go down when the requirements are less strict, uh, they're actually 
are increases in the number of cases. And as you see in the US, there has started to be an exponential growth in some states. And then eventually they mandated masks. So we want to prevent that. We don't want to be waiting until there is another wave before we mandate masks. Doris, did you have anything or questions about that section? Uh, I think one of the questions that has come often, and in fact, I spoke this morning with Jeff about it, is the issue of uh, face shields versus masks. And um, as far as I know, there has not been really any solid study that shows um, face shields without a mask, vis-a-vis -vis mask, which one is more effective. And that's for people that either they have difficulty with the, with the, um, with the mask itself versus face shields. And also we were talking with Jeff in relationship to long-term care. Um, RNO wants to push the position that uh, families can actually come as a, as a partners in care. And so then obviously uh, they need to be provided with PPE. And the issue of face shield, we were thinking, might be more um, economic to a certain extent than a regular mask because you can then tell the family member, the designated family member, take it home, clean it, et cetera, and use it. And it will give you likely a week of use versus a regular mask. I don't know if you have comments about the effectiveness, if you have seen anything. And I think there was a similar uh, question on the chat about it. Yes, that's right, Doris. And I just wanted to add that um, a question about if you wear a shield, do you also need a mask? So maybe you can ask well, both. Ideally, but the question is the first effectiveness, right? Yeah, for sure. So I would say first in my clinic, because I see babies, I see patients with cancer, immunocompromised, I wear both. I wear a face shield and a mask. Um, so for the public, usually it's you know, one or the other, most people don't wear both. I haven't seen any head-to-head -head comparisons between the two um, for COVID-19, but I think face shields are a reasonable alternative. Um, I wouldn't, you know, say one is 100% better than the other, but I think um, it's a reasonable alternative. So face shields cover the eyes, so that helps. Um, and they also allow for communication. So that's also important for, um, in the schools, teachers can use them because it helps, you know, kids understand the weak lips, things like that. And it's good for people who may be um, deaf also. Um, so face shields definitely have their benefits. Um, I'm concerned that, you know, if people are speaking, it may, you know, leak out through the edges. So it also has to be important that it has to cover up to your neck and around the face, things like that. So I think it's a reasonable alternative. Um, I would hesitate to say it's better or worse. I would just say it's another option for people. You want to see if there are other questions, Susan? Sure, there are. Um, thank you so much. Um, so what about donning and doffing um, and some public education around that? I don't know so if I just one question. Just one comment for people in general. Please do Google the blog because there are invited pieces about this that are fantastic um, that people have written, including Jennifer, but also other uh, individuals and I think a lot of that in general not today because today we can answer but when in doubt just google the blog and and the topic and it will start to show to you the pieces and of course they change as evidence starts to change but not on donning and doffing yes Jennifer I have another question um, is there any data showing the rate of infection for those who wear non-medical masks as recommended in the community? I don't think there's data specific, specifically for non-medical masks in the community. I think there's um, a study in Germany where they compared a, a locale where masks were mandated versus one that was not, and it showed that the a region that mandated masks did a lot better in terms of controlling cases. Um, I think there's a few others too, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. But when you're when you're talking, I just want to clarify for people: when you're talking masks for Canada, you're not talking the ones that they sell in the store. You are talking about cloth masks. So I just want to clarify for people: that's what we are discussing, right? The effectiveness, all the data that Jennifer showed in the U.S. and in other places, right? 
and the desire to get to 80%, we are talking about cloth masks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like we still have concerns about PPE shortage, especially as we are resuming um, elective procedures, things like that. So it's still best to reserve medical grade masks for the general public, uh, sorry, for healthcare professionals and the non-medical cloth masks are recommended for the public. Um, I would say though, the other thing is if you do see somebody on the street wearing a medical grade mask, you know, you can't really make assumptions about where they got that. They could be, you know, they did home renovations, like maybe they bought it beforehand. Like you really don't know, maybe they got it from their doctor's appointment. So I, I really hesitate like to say like I wouldn't judge people for wearing um, any type of mask as long as they are wearing one. Great, um, really helpful answers. I do um, have a question on that, Jennifer. How long can one use uh, surgical masks in the general population? Like as you said, if people have, and if they leave it for three days or whatever, how how long? So some people say if you leave it for 72 hours, then we can, you can reuse it. But that's also the problem with surgical masks. You shouldn't be reusing them in an ideal situation, right? Even in hospitals and healthcare settings, it's only because of the shortages that we're even talking about reusing masks and then 95s. Um, cloth masks also have that benefit that, you know, as soon as it get, gets dirty, you can wash it, you can reuse it. Um, there's less of an environmental impact, less garbage. So um, there are some benefits to cloth masks for that reason. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, question about, is a mask needed when one is standing behind a plexi shield? I think it depends. Sometimes I see people at the store, they have the plexi shield, but then the customer goes to the side and talks to them. So I, I think that really depends on like how well the plexi shield is um, protecting the person. And again, it, you know, sometimes we have to use our judgment and common sense. You know, if you're working in a closed office by yourself and like the door is closed, like you don't need to wear a mask. But if there's a lot of customer interaction, then as many layers of protection is helpful. Like I, I was at Costco and I saw, um, you know, a lady, she was, I think they started samples again and she was wearing a mask and she was like elderly, the worker. And then she had a plexiglass shield, but like someone went over and like leaned over the shield and talked to her and like, you know, I, I'm, and they, the customer wasn't wearing a mask because it's recommended, it's not mandated. So that makes me worried for the worker. Like even though she has two layers of protection and the customer is not wearing one, then his droplets can potentially still be infecting her. That's why if we can mandate masks, it will also offer even more protection. And I think that that answers the next question of the reluctance. Uh, they, in my view, from a policy perspective and my interactions with public health officials and government, the biggest reluctance, one is you cannot police it, but no one is saying police it, so I'm not sure that's a good excuse. The second is that you need to provide it uh, as a government, and I think we should. I mean, other countries have done it. And if you think what Jennifer said at the beginning is not only good for health, it's good for economic health. It is because we we can open then the we can open business much faster. So um, I don't know what else is the reluctance, but I interact every single day. We're pushing for it for both reasons: health and economic health. Yeah. Do you have any yeah. rationals that you have heard, Jennifer, of why there is still reluctance? And it's not only Ontario, Dr. Tam, too, still has not come out saying, use it. And the, 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 the um, social media and the messages from whether it's the prime minister or our own premier are not strong enough about use it, you must. So it's not only not mandated, it's not pushed kind of in an encouraging and, and, you know, convincing way. Yeah, I don't know if it's because initially they had, you know, said something different about masks and maybe now they're hesitant to tell people the opposite. I mean, I think it's a difficult situation and I understand that they're making decisions whereas we're just looking at from a health perspective, maybe they're also taking into consideration the shortages, like ordering from 
um, suppliers, things like that. Uh, the federal government um, had put in a tender for 13 million non-medical masks. So uh, I think that may be for federal government workers, um, but if they can order something like that for workers, they could also consider doing that for vulnerable populations, people without access to masks. So um, I'm sure that's a good starting point. The Alberta government has uh, handed out um, free masks to people in Alberta. Um, they did it by distributing through uh, fast food drive throughs I mean, that's a that's a good start. It would be helpful if it was also, you know, non-medical reusable masks so it can um, be used for longer periods of time. You can use it in like, you can distribute in community centers, other um, areas of need. So um, there's a lot of different ideas and I really hope that the government will look into this and especially if they do mandate masks, it's really important to also look for uh, distribution and access and things like that. Excellent. So, um, Dr. Kwan, I'm just looking at the time. It's 7.48. Um, do you have time um, in your schedule to answer, like to continue with the last bit of your presentation? There are some more questions you've answered. I think you've answered most of them. Um, there are a few more in the chat box. Um, and usually we also end with a bit of a cheer. <laughs> um, okay. And today the cheer is for you and for Mask for Canada. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I just have two slides left. So um, perhaps I can finish the two slides and then we can finish with any questions because I can't, I can't see the great. questions right now. Okay. Um, um, so, um, so how to spell pandemic without panic. So I actually wrote another article. This was um, April 2nd and this was very early on when the lockdown was happening. Um, everyone was talking up on toilet paper and th we thought we were going to uh, run out of food and we were worried it was going to go from a two week lockdown to two months to two years until we get a vaccine, if we get a vaccine. So at this time I wrote this because I wanted to quell some of those uh, uh, fears and anxiety and to understand that there is a way to get back to normal um, within three to six months, I had said, um, and with economic recovery um, and reopening. So when you spell pandemic without panic, you take out the letters for panic, you get DEM, which is distancing, easy testing, and masks. Um, so um, what I've learned since then also is easy testing and tracing, because tracing is also really important. Um, and hopefully with these three factors that we can make it very accessible for everyone, um, you know, fast, easy, widespread testing um, and masks. So hopefully with these things, we can have a return back to our new normal. And uh, some people hate this term, the new normal, um, because I think it, you know, it, it reminds us of how things have changed and how we can back, get back to our old normal for a very long time. Um, but I think we should focus on making the new normal better than the old normal. We have learned so much. We have collaborated. We've worked together. Um, we've really also come together as a society, you know, making cloth masks. People are donating their PPE, donating their time. It's really inspiring. So um, I think, as uh, Doris always says, like, together we can do this. And um, I think focusing on the future um, being better than our past uh, will be something that we can work on um, together. And, you know, I think everyone working on the front lines are heroes, everyone who stayed at home, um, you know, sacrificing um, their um, time going out, that's, you know, that's also being a hero. I know people have been separated from their families, missed events, weddings, funerals, everyone has done their part in sacrificing. And I think that is something that we are going to remember for years down the road. But, um, together as Canadians, we will grow through this and we will be stronger. And if there's any other uh, pandemics we have learned and we have uh, figured out the strategies and hopefully in the future, we will be able to tackle those things together. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, thank you. So there are a few can, questions. Uh, um, Susan, can you read the question of Cindy, please? She sent me last night a similar question. Just sure. Answer, Cindy's, so Cindy's that we provide the right information. Yes. So Cindy's asking a question. How do you respond to a statement made by Dr. Osterholm, the director of the Center of Disease and Research and Policy, who said, never before in my 45-year career have I seen such a far-reaching public recommendation issued by 
any government agency without a single source of data or information to support it. This is an extremely worrisome precedent of implementing policies not based on science-based data or why they were issued without such data. So looking at this statement, I assume she's talking about masks, but that can also be, you know, talking about lockdowns, uh, forcing people to close their businesses, forcing people to stay home. So there has been a lot of uh, unprecedented changes in this pandemic. And I think that it's very difficult for people who are leaders to make decisions fast in order to save lives um, while using the best available evidence. So uh, Dr. Osterholm, I actually did read the document that Cindy sent and I also looked at some um, later podcasts. It's really interesting. Um, he has a lot of expertise in terms of, um, you know, the different studies that look into masks and things like that. So we are not saying that we know 100% for sure that masks um, will, you know, save millions of lives and it will be the end all be all. We are saying that masks are in addition to other practices. And if we are wrong, then I don't think we have really done much harm. You know, we can throw away the pieces of cloth and then we can go back to washing our hands and distancing. But if we are right that masks can save lives and we are not doing it, then people are dying, then we might go back into a lockdown, we might have more um, outbreaks, um, we will have more people who may survive but have long-term health outcomes. So um, I personally think taking the precautionary principle right now is very important. And again, we're not arguing for mandatory masks in all settings. We are saying in high risk settings, such as public transportation and indoor public spaces, like shops and things like that, it should be mandatory. And it's a temporary measure. We're not saying it has to be forever, everyone's going to wear a mask. Again, it's temporary. And as soon as things are under control, maybe there's more studies to help us understand the importance of masks, uh, whether we should do it or not then we can always revisit and change our mind. But I think right now it is the right thing to do. That's a very helpful answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwan. Um, there is so another question that has been twice, I think, here, Susan. Uh, if you can define the age of young children. Yeah, so um, as I said before, some uh, jurisdictions define it by two, some by five. I don't think anyone knows the answer. I don't think anyone knows any, uh, like, definite answers for anything right now. Um, but, you know, it really depends on the child too. Some kids are better at some things than others. So you can always, um, you know, test it. You can teach the child to wear a mask, you know, put it on for a second, take it off. Like, it's like learning how to tie your shoelaces. It's like learning how to write. You can always see what that individual child is capable of doing. And we're not saying that, you know, if the child can't wear a mask, they can't go to school. But, you know, if we can teach them, if we can provide them, make it available, if most of them can wear it, then that will definitely ensure that a return to school is safer. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got, it's at 7.55. I have two, I think, are quick questions. I'm wondering, Dr. Kwan, if you can stop sharing your screen and then we'll set up for our cheer. Um, and while you do that, um, just one question. Um, I've seen people who are wearing masks but have pulled the mask down below their nose. It's just covering their mouth. Does this negate the effectiveness or is it a little better than nothing at all? Um... <laughs> Proper mask wearing is very important. So I definitely have seen that too. Um, so hopefully as mask wearing becomes more normalized that uh, people are also learning, right? Um, I'm sure when we all started our careers, it was difficult to learn to wear all the layers of PPE and things like that, but we eventually figured it out. So um, hopefully the general public is also smart enough to learn how to wear a mask. I'm sure they are. People can learn to drive. I think driving a car is a lot harder than wearing a mask. So um, hopefully if the government can promote more public education campaigns, then um, people will learn to do it properly. Great, thank you. And I see um, that Olivia is promoting more people to be on the screen for the cheer. And we need everybody to have the mic on so we can hear yes. your cheers. And, and uh, one, one, your one last question. On. Can we ask one last question while we're getting the camera set up and the, and the sound uh, working? Um, are UV machines as effective as they claim in disinfecting 99% of viruses in masks? 
Um, so was the question UV disinfection for masks? Yes. Um, so I don't work in a hospital, so I don't have access to any of these UV machineries. I know they have also used them to disinfect hospital rooms. Um, I think, again, this is all brought to light because of the shortages. Like if there was not a shortage, we would not even be using UV light to disinfect it. So I don't personally know the effectiveness um, and I can't really speak to that. Like I don't, I, I think ideally we need to fix the shortage issue. That's the true issue. And it's fixable. Yeah. So I think that's a very good point. So excellent responses. I think we've, uh, you've answered everything. Um, so I will um, hand it over to everyone for our cheer. What are we cheering for? Cheering Mask for Canada? We are cheering for Dr. Kwan and Mask for Canada. Okay. You. Do you have your elements to cheer, Dr. Kwan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We need you to grab in the kitchen something. <laughs> yeah. Time. Um, I think some people are with the, you need to share on, share on, put your, your mics on, guys. You need to put your mics on, otherwise we don't hear. Terry, you need to put nice the to mic see you, on. Oli Olivia, too, mic on. Look at that, Gloria, I like your stuff. Wow, we can cheer together. <laughs> okay, so I'm start of the video. Okay. We're cheering for Dr. Kwan and Mask for Canada. 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 Mask for healthcare workers and other essential services. And for Dr. Kwan and Mask for, for Canada. Canada. Here we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwan. It's a fantastic pleasure to have you with us. And uh, if at any point you think that we can be helpful in any other way, just send a note. And we will be happy to have you again. And if we get more questions, we will send them your way. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Susan, next, next, when is next? So, so next Monday, we have the health system transformation uh, webinar. Um, so we're going to be um, focusing on... Let me just on see. health system transformation and where we are at and the consultations that the government is doing and when we expect wave two and what we will do about that. We will specifically focus also on long-term care. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. The other piece that people need to know that we are pushing big time is the reintegration of families during the summer and then for the second wave. And that is proving to be a bigger challenge than even masks. Yeah. So, see you next week, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Same time, Good same place. I'm working. Thank Happy you. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Happy, Happy Canada, Canada Day. Happy Canada, Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. And if you go somewhere, wear a mask. Everywhere. Wear a mask. Everywhere. Everywhere we do. Bye-bye. <laughs>